Well, I want to thank our session sponsor here, Key Stud, a very simple concept, a thermally broken insulated wall stud assembly for use in exterior walls and party walls made right in Minnesota. Uh, the Key Stud is a new building product that uses two machine stress rated uh, number two lumber members as an internal truss system and a froth in place closed cell foam. Um, based on initial testing, a four to seven point drop in the HERS index rating and energy efficiency over a standard two by six wall construction. Um, nearly as efficient as continuous insulation for an estimated one fourth of the cost. The T-Stead wall assembly comprises of all the members needed to build an exterior uh, or interior wall, including the top plate, bottom plates, sill plate, under windows, all wall studs and cripples, and most headers used in construction today, up to an eight inch wide opening. T-Stud has been tested for uh, USG in their state-of-the-art soundproof testing facility, and the wall assembly provides an STC um, rating of at least plus six to ensure um, sound transmission is reduced, um, and 90% uh, improved over noise control convert, uh, compared to two by six framing can also be used within the interior walls like between bathrooms or laundry rooms. Head over to uh, www.tstud.com today to learn more. All right, well, welcome everybody to Building Materials Reuse Market, the who, what, where, and why. This course is approved for one hour and continuing ed, um, lead AP uh, and GBCI, certified green professional, certified green home professional, AIBD, NARI Green, uh, and BPI, non-whole house as well as uh, AIA HSW, which may make it applicable to your local state-based design or contractor license. Uh, today I'm your moderator, and my name is Brett Little, and I'm the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about what's going on in the uh, material reuse market, and then also trying to tie it into, um, you know, what kind of benefits or challenges we see to how uh, the material reuse market plays into uh, achieving the Lead for Homes rating system in the material section. And so we're really excited to have the executive director of the Building Material Reuse Association, Joe Connell. Uh, he is the new interim director there. He's previously led the Portland Metro Habitat Resource for about 12 years, leading that organization to become one of the largest and most well-respected reuse retail operations in the nation. Prior to that, he spent about 20 years in the construction industry as a remodeler and cabinet maker. He now lives with his wife on a small offshore island in Down East, Maine, in a 150-year-old home. When not at the computer, he's either walking uh, the shore or in the kitchen. He's also a pride, proud kilt wearer, uh, quilt maker, and gardener. Favorite quote, I wake up every morning determined both to change the world and have one heck of a good time. Sometimes this makes planning the day a little difficult. E.B. White. And so we're excited to have uh, Joel here joining us today, and uh, feel free to take it away. All right. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate being here. Um, I, when Brad asked me about this, I said, there's a quote I want to use to start with. Uh, that I, It's foundational for me. Uh, it came from Brad Guy. It's called, Waste is Just a Product of Bad Design. Um, when I when I think about that, um, I automatically go to what is design. So I think about the definition of design, and and I, I, so I looked it up. It's the purpose, planning, or intention that exists or is thought to exist behind an action factor material. What it boils down to in my mind is design is the first stage. It's the nucleus of everything that follows. You think about everything in our built environment, everything in our world actually that's man-made or or induced by us starts with design so that's the thought behind Brad's comment um, you know the waste issues that we have now the problems with we're de that we're dealing with now all started with design con concepts from in our, in our past and in my mind when I think about that I think about the, the last 70 years primarily um, and, the, and that the, the past 70 years the design has followed the post-war economics of plenty and building with new, or creating with new. And that paradigm was not historic. Uh, it's not how we built for millennial um, uh, up, until, up until recently. 
uh, and I believe it was fund fundamentally dependent upon access to natural materials and transportation systems and manufacturing systems that followed our mobilizing um, the world and our nations uh, in the last two great wars, or in the two great big wars. And when you think about it, even the Revolutionary War was very much about um, natural resources, access to natural resources. This is it's what our country represented to Europe at the time. Um, so, you know, you, you can't avoid talking about design when you talk about waste. Um, all right, next slide. How do we get here? Um, it's a long story, um, but I wanted to show this slide. Uh, if any of you have been here, you, you, you'll appreciate this. Uh, it's Mesa Verde uh, down in the Four Corners. Uh, my wife and I were there this fall, and we're totally blown away. Um, this, this is the, cliff, the famous cliff dwellings um, of the Anastasi and, the, uh, and those folks down there. They're thought to be six to 800 years old. Um, and they were they're built with the stone that was around them, but they were built forever. Um, and there's even a, a, a myth that a, a local was telling us about while we were down there that there, there's a belief that the people who built this, who only actually lived there for about 100 years and they have no idea why they, why they abandoned them, um, but they built them to return to someday because um, they're lasting they're lasting a very long time. And the stones from one uh, were used to build another. Um, probably a better example or, or a better photo of this, but I haven't been there, would be um, uh, Rome um, and how they would use the stones again and again and again, century after century after century. Um, so historically, we did not, we built with reuse. Um, we designed with reuse in mind. Um, how we got there, how we got to where we are now is um, not a very complicated story, but it, it is a long one, I believe. And part of it, uh, part of the foundation of it, I believe, is that we used to think the world was a lot smaller, was a lot bigger than it is. Um, if any of you remember this movie, uh, this is The Gods Must Be Crazy from 1980. Um, and it's primarily based on a, uh, someone up in an airplane throwing a Pepsi bottle, or, oh, sorry, Coke bottle, um, out the window of the plane. And uh, the, the, um, the folks there find the Coke bottle and have no idea what it is. Um, so I try imagining a world now, anywhere in the world now, where someone doesn't know what a Coke bottle is um, when they find it. And I think, you know, back in 80, it wasn't outrageous, 1980, it wasn't outrageous to think that there still might be some folks in our world who are isolated enough um, to not know what a Coke bottle was. And we believe that our world still had some sense of endlessness to it um, and that we were not living on a finite planet. Uh, I remember I lived in New York back in the 80s and they used to barge the garbage out into the ocean and just dump it. Um, we thought the ocean was finite, um, and as uh, all of you are probably aware, we know it's not. There's a continent of plastic floating in the Pacific now. Um, you know, we've, we're all very much aware now um, that our world is finite, that it's a lot smaller than we used to think. Um, but we didn't see it that way for a long time, and so we just kept capitalizing on our natural environment and uh, pillaging, if you will. Um, the other reason we've gotten to where we are is subsidies. Um, I love this photo. Um, I lived out, out in Oregon for, for 12 years, and this was a very similar, familiar uh, site to us out there. Um, I don't know if this is Oregon, but it doesn't matter. Um, but we partly got to where we are because of subsidized infra infrastructure. Um, and I'll get into this a little more later, but um, think about why a two by four um, gets from the forest to the lumber yard and still costs you less than your lunch today will cost. In fact, I, I looked up the, the price at, at Home Depot this morning for a two by four and it was $3.06 for a two by four eight footer. Um, so think about why that would cost you less probably than your coffee at Starbucks this morning. Um, it's not really possible. It, it doesn't make any sense when you really think about it. Um, and the, the true cost of that two by four is hidden by the subsidies. 
um, they're hidden by the fact that the, the train the train systems were built with subsidies, uh, the roads, the you know all of the different things that um, we depend on, and we don't even think about being dependent on them. Um, I guess the coffee is subsidized in a lot of ways too, but um, we're talking about two by fours today, <laughs> materials. Um, so, you know, when we think about all of these different things about why we are where we are, there's a lot of different pieces to it, but it mostly boils down to the fact that we built systems over the last hundred years or perhaps even longer that made it possible for us to take advantage of our natural resources and continue to use them for new, as new products. Um, I remember when I was a kid, it was anathema to use anything twice. And that's still the case in a lot of our world. But, um, you know, at least now we're becoming a lot more conscious and a lot, of, a lot more aware. Um, but for the most of the 20th century, we really weren't, and we weren't thinking about it. Um, so what I'm trying to do today here is, is show that, that path and, and where we're at now and where I think we're going. So, uh, and why I think the reuse industry is a big part of it. Um, so next, next slide, I want to look at who is the reuse industry. Um, a lot of people, I think, think of us as, you know, small pockets of little operations here or there um, scattered around the country. Um, but we're a lot more than that. Um, we're deconstructionists, retailers, uh, all, all this list here. Um, it's a vast array of related industries. Um, you know, we're not one little shop here, one little shop here like we were, like we were in the old days. Again, I remember going to upstate New York, um, you know, in high school and college and wandering around through old barns full of beautiful junk, uh, they call them, you know, barn junkyards and stuff like that. It was uh, amazing stuff, but they were very isolated from each other. And uh, back around that time and in the early 90s, certainly a lot of reuse people started getting a little more, a little more savvy and started talking to each other. Um, Early 90s was when the BMRA uh, came into existence because uh, a lot of these people started started wanting to gather together and learn from each other, much like the recyclers um, had, had been doing since the 70s. Um, so we're connected now um, much more than we were. Um, we're forming networks. We're talking with each other. We're learning from each other. Um, we're starting to incorporate uh, architects. Uh, designers, getting back to that opening statement there, uh, there's a lot more people involved and a, a much broader array. Um, it's not just about salvaging stuff, it's not and reselling it as is, it's also upcycling um, and uh, taking um, things the next step further, remanufacturing, that's a whole other part of it as well. But what unites us all is that common goal of salvaging and retaining the value in our natural materials. Um, the one thing we are not, though, as an industry is we're not recyclers. Um, and I bring that up here because a lot of people still confuse the two. They still talk and use the words interchangeably. Um, recycling is basically when a material is pulled out and it's, it's uh, downcycled, if you will. It's turned into something else, converted to something else, uh, where its natural state is devalued. Um, and a little more about that later uh, with, with lumber. Um, but reuse is about taking that material, keeping it in its, in its state, uh, in the state where it's removed, or making something more or better from that product, not about breaking it back down again. And um, we're seeing a lot more, like I said, we're seeing a lot more architects and designers coming into our industry, um, getting excited about what we're doing. Hopefully some of you that are here today are here, are here for that reason, remodelers and builders as well. Um, we're not just the, the reuse people off on the side anymore. We're becoming a much more integrated part of, of the entire built, built environment, which is very exciting to me uh, coming from, you know, 20, some 15 years of, of doing reuse now. It's very exciting to see that we're coming, uh, we're coming into more of the more of the mainstream. So, getting into a little bit more about who we are and what we do, um, 
we are deconstructionist um, first and foremost. We start there because that's where that's where the chain starts. Um, when thing, all these these building materials become available again to us, uh, whatever our part in the industry is, um, because they're deconstructed, because they're pulled out of existing buildings. Um, so I, I love this. I love this quote or this definition: uh, the systematic dismantling of a structure in order to preserve the building materials for reuse. Um, pretty simple and basic. And here's a great picture of a house in the midst of being deconstructed. Um, and this is one way to do deconstruction. When you look at this photo, um, this is a house that's being dismantled piece by piece. Um, it's called hand deconstruction, where the entire building is taken apart kind of in reverse order. Although in true reverse order, they would have taken the roof off first, but um, there's various ways to do it. Um, the, other, the other way of doing it, there's other ways of doing it. There's hybrid deconstruction uh, where mechanized um, uh, operations can come in, take roofs off, take walls down, uh, separate them out, put them aside, and then they're further deconstructed by hand there. So uh, there's a lot of different models for doing this. Um, I think a lot of folks, when they think about deconstruction, are only aware of the one style of deconstruction um, uh, that's shown here. Uh, so I just want to make sure that folks know that there's a lot of opportunity for more hybrid models. And uh, we're looking into um, ways to talk about that more and publicize that more too. Um, one of the advantages, or a couple of the advantages to deconstruction, um, I can't help but mention when I look at this house, is um, uh, the number one that comes to mind that this is asbestos abatement. Um, when a house gets crunched, um, it, it is, it's required in most most jurisdictions, it's required to be tested for asbestos before it's demolished. Now, you can test it, you can have someone go in and look to see if there's asbestos, but they're not digging very deep to find it and to look. They're just looking fairly superficially. Um, I think there was a study by the Rebuilding Center in Portland done that said 25% of the homes that were tested for asbestos before being deconstructed where more asbestos was found during the deconstruction phase. Um, so what happens, you might have a floor over an asbestos floor or asbestos pipes that are buried behind a wall and a tester that goes in to look in the first place is not even going to see those things. It's not until we start deconstructing that we find those underneath underlying layers of asbestos and then that has to be abated again. So when a house just gets crunched or a building gets crunched, um, by a machine and tossed away, there's no second look back at where the asbestos might be. So it's released into the air or into the, into the neighborhood um, and can be a significant problem. So some communities are looking at, uh, this is one of the reasons why they required it in Portland, Oregon, um, because of this, they're requiring um, more and more deconstruction um, so that uh, they, can, they can get at some of these underlying issues. Hey, uh, Joe, could that also be um, the same could be said for lead? Yes, except, um, and, and that's, that's a good question. Um, n deconstruction um, doesn't abate the lead necessarily um, in that the, the lead doesn't have to be removed beforehand. Um, part of the process of deconstruction is taking taking uh, all these materials of course uh, down, of course, um, but they don't have to necessarily be abated in the process first, meaning um, thrown thrown away. You know, uh, as with the asbestos, there is work in again in Portland um, talking about um, abating lead in a different way, um, but that hasn't quite happened yet. There's still a lot of places that will that will accept and sell um, uh, lead, lead painted um, trim and molding and cabinets and things like that. Um, my stores in Portland, we didn't take that, uh, take those products uh, for resale because we wanted the lead out of the environment completely. Um, so it, it's a good, good question and a big issue. Um, but yes, if, it, if the lead is to be abated, 
um, then definitely deconstruction is a better way to do it because it can be handled differently, um, taken down, separa separated, um, and sent to a different facility than the rest of the materials would be. Um, okay, another big part of our industry is retail outlets. Um, when I started at the Portland store, there were um, probably, I think, about 200 and almost 300 um, Habitat stores around the country. Uh, there's almost 900 stores now. Um, and that's just one part of our retail industry, of course. Uh, it's an easier one to measure because Habitat knows how many stores they have. Uh, what's harder to count are the, the um, large or small uh, retailers around the country. That could be anything from Urban Ore in California, which is about 100,000 square feet plus, uh, I think, two acres of yard space, um, all the way down to the little mom and pop shop in a, in a downtown area reselling um, old, old vintage reclaimed stuff. So there's really no way to know how many um, there are in retail outlets, but we know there's thousands easily. Um, and we know they're growing fast. I know, um, you know, again, I go back to Portland because that's where I was for so many years. But uh, as we were growing our restores, we were finding secondary uh, businesses popping up everywhere. Um, more and more, more and more of our shoppers actually were shopping, grabbing the good stuff, and then marking it up and selling it, so selling it in their own little shops. Um, we learned the hard way to mark it up a little bit more. So I hope we weren't losing too much in that game, but um, but still, we were providing um, materials for subsequent industries um, down the line. Another one is upcyclers and remakers. The difference here is, is that um, along the way, we've created um, other industries uh, within reuse. Um, in, in the past, um, like when I started in this, the, the retailers would mostly sell to homeowners, uh, small contractors, uh, folks that were using the materials more directly themselves. Um, as we've grown, as reuse has become more commonplace and we're getting more materials, there are a lot more upcyclers and remakers. Um, this slide's of a, of a, a cute piece I found online um, that is more artsy, uh, but there's also a, a, a other, lots of other other industries popping up within this. Uh, you guys in the in the Michigan area might be uh, familiar with uh, Detroit um, Audio, um, taking reclaimed lumber and turning it into um, stereo uh, speakers and stuff like that. They're very cool reuse. Um, there's, of course, all the restaurants, the uh, reusing of timbers and uh, reclaimed materials in restaurants and stores. Um, that's been uh, really growing lately. Um, but there's also a lot of small upcyclers as well, uh, just the, you know, the repainting of shingles. And, uh, and I meant to put a slide in here, and I forgot to, uh, but it was a, my niece, who's six years old, took a, um, uh, an old cedar shingle and painted a cityscape on it. Uh, and it was amazing. Um, so it even trickles down to that level of, of just arts and crafts and uh, folks doing uh, fun, fun little things like that. Uh, and again, on the other end of the spectrum is someone like Pioneer Millworks, who is taking down large, very large structures uh, across the country and salvaging that lumber and reform, refabricating it into um, timbers for timber frame uh, homes and construction. Uh, so there's all kinds of scale in there, and we're all, um, like I think, interrelated and connected to each other. So a little shift here into why. Um, why is our industry so imperative, um, especially at this point? Um, I'm going to go back to the to the two by four and the and the cup of coffee there. Um, it's been very striking to me for a while that, uh, in, and this again goes back to being in Oregon, and uh, um, you know a land of, of Douglas firs and amazing trees and uh, seeing the logging there. And, you know, a two by four is still cheaper than a reclaimed two by four. And when I started thinking about how that happens, um, you know, watching a two by four travel around the country and being shipped and, and you know, the whole 
process involved to get a two by four to Home Depot where it sells for $3 is amazingly complex. Whereas a reclaimed two by four, which probably cost, you know, has to cost twice as much to, to be valuable for a retailer to sell, um, is, is not traveling very far. It's not being logged or milled. It's just being reclaimed from a house and maybe moved across town and resold. But it's still very hard to compete price-wise with that two by four at Home Depot, um, which blows my mind when I think about it. Um, because the Virgin two by four has probably traveled around the country more than I have um, to get there. Um, but it goes back to the subsidies and it goes back to the infrastructure and the, the whole um, way in which we view our natural resources and how we get them into our buildings. Um, and it, it's, about, it's about looking at the true cost of something. You know, if we, if we really had to pay the full true cost of a new two by four at Home Depot, we would be tearing houses down just to get the two by four material um, to build new stuff. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, my other example is a door. I look at a door, and this is not so much about reclaimed, but it, it is definitely about waste. Uh, we used to get doors uh, that were given to us, and this is one example of many, but we'd get, we'd get a door with a scratch on it from Lowe's or Home Depot donated to us. Um, and it'd be a perfectly good door. And I'd think about it, okay, this is southern yellow pine, so it probably came from, the wood probably came from Georgia or somewhere down in the southeast. Um, it was logged, it was milled, it was sent somewhere to become a door, perhaps even overseas, um, to become a door, um, and then shipped back and at a warehouse for a while, and then shipped to oh, Lowe's again to be sold, and then transported to someone's home, and they open it up and there's a scratch on it, and they haul it to the dump. And, or they, they return it to Lowe's, who then traditionally would have uh, just thrown it in their, in their trash. Uh, but fortunately, they would then think of us, which was a, a more recent development. Um, but the, the amount of waste, the significant amount of waste that that represents within our industry is incredible. So it's not just the waste of reclaimed um, uh, stuff that we're talking about here. It's, it's a new product as well. Um, that comes through our, our built environment industry uh, that needs to be reclaimed as well. All right. So it's estimated that about, about um, a billion board feet of two by four and two by six materials uh, are in the U.S. Uh, in U.S. homes right now. Um, and please don't anybody type in. Um, where do I get that info? Because I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, I can find it if anybody wants to know, but it was something that was I inherited here at the BMRA. Um, these guys are, are out of Baltimore, and they're selling reclaimed lumber. And when you think about our housing stock and that billion board feet uh, and its age and the, re and the replacement that our housing stock is going to go through in the next 50 years, um, especially as we develop better ways to build homes. Um, think about the, the, the amount of material that's going to come out of this ex existing stock. Uh, I think I heard somewhere else that there's an estimate in the next 50 years that 30% of our housing stock will be rotated. 30% uh, of a billion board feet should not go to waste. Uh, it really shouldn't. Um, and then there's the jobs that go with this, but I'll, I'll have a little more to say on that uh, in a moment. Um, these guys are from Baltimore. Uh, I did a tour of Baltimore recently, um, as well as, as Pittsburgh, uh, and I hear the same message from a lot of Rust Belt, uh, Rust Belt cities um, of the amount of housing that's already vacant, uh, that's blighted, um, and that needs to come down or seriously re renovated. Um, without deconstruction and without reuse of these materials, that's an amazing amount of waste. Um, and it goes back to that, that billion board feet and, and how do we capitalize that. Um, another, another way to look at this is the CD version. 
17 minutes, and this is, this is an old, old um, uh, quote here, so it's, I'm guessing it's a lot higher now, but I couldn't find anything newer. Uh, with 17 tons of wood materials go, getting landfilled every year. Um, you know, it, again, it goes back to what that waste is and why deconstruction and reuse is so important. Um, because as our buildings age and we replace them, even if we're, we're replacing them with more energy efficient buildings, um, we, do a, we do our world a terrible injustice to not capture the materials coming out of these old buildings. Um, you know, we're, we're doing really good with inventing how to do new, uh, you know, net zero, things like that. You know, it's, it's terrific work that's going to change our world. But we can't leave this stuff behind. Uh, because the embodied carbon in a billion feet of, of two-by material is just too much to ignore. Um, we, we have to utilize it. We have to take advantage of it. And I, I did see one note here about, uh, or one question here about upcyclers. Um, sorry, I'm not too used to doing webinars, but I, I, I did look down and see that. Upcycler, in my mind, is anybody that takes um, it, and that's why I use that one photo of the dresser drawers and stuff. It's not me remanufacturing so much as it's taking some some products, uh, some materials, and turning them into um, a piece of art or a piece of decorative furniture or something like that. That's usually how the term is is used. It's more craftsy uh, than anything else. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, let's see. Next one. Okay, um, I, I put this in here because um, I know that um, this, there's some leads, leads folks here, some leads points here and stuff. I'm a little out of out of my comfort zone talking about leads because I'm not too familiar with all of all of the standards and who gets what for what points for what and stuff. Um, but I did want to look at this because I was I was looking at a note I saw in there about um, uh, co-mingling, getting points for sending lumber in co-mingled containers to MRFs. Um, and I had to challenge that. Um, here's a picture, and this is from a friend of mine who owns a MRF facility, um, of a pile of lumber that came in that is, um, uh, and this wasn't even co-mingled, but this, this came in from a project. Um, this is not sellable. This is not salvageable in my mind. This is, and she even said, this is going for hog fuel. Um, I'm on the embodied uh, carbon network and there's a discussion going on there about um, how much carbon is actually sequestered in our forest, uh, how much is uh, sequestered in lumber, uh, things like that. And those are really good questions. But, you know, I think there is a lot, uh, they, there's a conceptual problem in my mind with saying you can, it's okay on some level to send good lumber to be hog fueled. Um, like, and like I said, we, we've come a long way in, in a lot of ways, um, but this is a whole, I think. Um, and again, I'm not the best to speak to this, but so I'm, I'm bringing it up as much as a question as every, anything else. Um, but how is this sustainable um, if it's going to be hog fueled? Um, there's a lot of wood in there, and I have, you know, I've seen, I've been at at some MRFs and some transfer stations where, you know, it is just, it it kind of makes you weep to see some of the some of the stuff that's going into a landfill or into hog fuel uh, that we know could be could be redone. Um, you bring up a good point here with another question. Do structural engineers who seal their drawings okay with reclaimed structural members? Uh, and do building officials who give you a permit are okay with wood, um, possibly with mold? Um, Oregon has passed a new uh, code uh, legislation, uh, code requirement that allows for uh, reclaimed lumber to be used in um, in homes, in residential. Um, I don't think that includes structural timbers. Um, you can get uh, reclaimed wood uh, reclassified, restamped if needed. Uh, so it is one of the bigger challenges within our industry right now with using reclaimed lumber. 
um, but it's one that is being uh, being being worked on. Um, they they can permit it. Uh, wood with mold, rot, knots, anything like that would be rejected, whether it was new or reclaimed. Um, so the standards that exist in codes would would bar any undesirable reclaimed lumber as well, and that's part of what what Portland was working with is that why make it an arbitrary standard to not include reclaimed um, if it's solid wood. Um, if it's not solid wood, it shouldn't be used whether it's, whether it's new or reclaimed. So. I feel like I might be going too fast here, but um, so if anyone else has questions. Uh, this this was a slide that I also inherited. Um, it's talking about embodied carbon, and it's comparing new construction to uh, zero net energy new construction to existing building reuse. Um, and what's what's so interesting to me about this slide is the raw material extraction on the far left um, is of course much less. And you look at even even zero net energy construction, um, the materials that can go into those high, highly sophisticated homes um, can require a lot more um, material and energy um, in, their, in their creation, in the mining and the inception. Uh, of course, once the building is built, the operational carbon is, is way down. But it's that initial one, and it, it gets back to what I was saying before, it, it's all of the natural resources that we've invested that are, are embodied in our built environment at this point um, that where, where we see the difference. Um, so do we tear down all our existing buildings and make them all net zero? Yes, and from an operational point of view, that's a very good way to think about our built environment, but only if we utilize what's embodied in our existing building structures. In my, in my mind. Otherwise, we're kind of missing a key point in my mind. Um, and, and of course, standard new construction wasted all along the way. Um, the other thing with, with the, the third part down here, the existing building reuse, is um, as a, a, a end, end of life demolition. Um, and I, I challenge this a little bit, um, I don't understand it, um, in that the end of life for some of our buildings that are existing is going to be problematic because of our building techniques uh, from the in the 70s, 80s, into, into the 90s. A lot of those homes, as they age, are going to be a problem because of adhesives, um, because of the way they were constructed. Uh, some of the materials that were used are going to be bigger issues for us down the line. Um, right now, if we go to tear down a house that's full of adhesives, uh, spray foam insulation, things like that. There's, it's very hard to capture enough, enough value there. Um, so I'm not sure that this slide is taking that into account with the end of life for reuse, um, especially if a, if a zero net building is constructed for, uh, for deconstruction. Um, I, was, I saw a slide presentation on an amazing um, uh, building that was built on a college campus in Massachusetts, I believe. Um, where it, the whole building was built with reuse in mind and deconstruction in mind. Uh, there were little, if any, adhesives. Uh, things were bolted together. Um, they knew that 100 years down the line, if they had to take this building apart, they could, and they could reuse the materials. Um, okay, I have another question here I'm going to take a quick stab at. Uh, it says, somebody has to review all reclaimed building materials. Question, will it be a new profession, job, or just like LEED? Um, I think it's going to have to be incorporated within the codes, within the code officials, um, and that's been part of the resistance. Um, in Oregon, when we passed it, um, passing the code change was in some ways the easy part. Um, getting code officials to recognize it, understand it, and work with it uh, was going to be the big challenge. Um, I don't know if it could be a new profession. Um, 
but certainly uh, the existing the the idea is to challenge existing code enforcement um, and, and regulations to allow for it as a as a first step. Um, and I would just weigh in there and 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 based on what we're seeing and some of the things we're looking into here locally, uh, I really would think it would have to be a uh, an entirely new profession. Um, that is probably a good thing, right? You know, more jobs, more things to work on. But um, just based on the skill sets we're seeing, at least locally in our market, um, it is definitely a different, uh, different skill set. Um, but uh, anyway, there's a there's another question here. Does Virgin versus recycled paper face the same subsidy issue uh, since recycled paper is more expensive? Um, well, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I do believe that a lot of the recycled industry has been subsidized, um, and and part of part of, of you know its success over the last 20 years, um, as opposed to uh, reclaimed building materials, has been uh, that investment. Um, you think about uh, glass. Uh, glass is you know, it's in some ways it's easier to transport. It can be crunched up. It can be moved on. Um, you know, it it's part of that downgrading of the material um, and then turning it back into into new products. It has to be crunched up again. So it doesn't matter if you break it when it's moving. It doesn't matter how you handle it. You can handle it in mass. You can separate it uh, a little differently. Harder to do with building materials um, and don't know if I'm answering the question well enough, but I, I do think that there's been a significant amount of subsidies to that industry that we haven't seen anything of uh, within the rebuilding, uh, within the um, uh, reuse building materials. And Brent, you, you get to a good, uh, you're two slides away from talking about jobs, so I'll get there in a second. Just one more on this, in, in the environmental impact side. Um, and this, this slide is a, is a comparison uh, for both hardwood and softwood, uh, flooring and framing, lumber, the difference between virgin and, and reclaimed as far as um, uh, potential emissions um, and carbon. Um, so it's a significant drop using, using reclaimed. So we get into jobs. Um, this is near and dear to my heart, um, the job side. Um, when I started with the Portland Restores uh, 13 years ago, we had three employees. Uh, when I left, we had 70. A third of those employees were workforce employment folks that came to us um, through various programs and were then uh, employed with us as, as regulars. Um, I'm proud of this because, and I want to make a real point of it because um, these are all folks who, who had barriers uh, to employment. And we were able to incorporate them into our industry on entry level positions um, in ways that the construction industry has a hard time doing. Um, because of the, the skill level required for entry level into deconstruction and reuse being fairly, fairly minimal. Um, so, you know, looking at this slide, you know, we produce seven jobs for every one with waste. And I would say most of those jobs are entry level positions. Um, and, and this, you know, it, there were so many people coming to us uh, that needed needed this work and that needed a chance to change their lives. And now I'm, I'm getting a little more into community development here, but in my mind, I can't separate them. Um, and that's part of the beauty of our industry is that we are local. You know, I, I said before, we're starting to network, we're starting to, to build an industry um, that's nationwide, but we're all sourced pretty locally. Um, and that means jobs are local, and that means um, we're, we're helping, we're part of helping to build our community. And it's the flip of where, where I started um, earlier in this conversation, talking about the national subsidies, the uh, major investments, the, you know, those things that that took things away from being localized so much. The only part of that chain for that two by four is the local logger that might have cut the tree down. Um, after that, it, it gets less and less 
localized all the way all the way through the chain. Um, but a lot of the work that we're looking at, a lot of the work of, 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 of remanufacturing and rebuilding and these salvaging these materials, stays locally, and a good percentage of it can, can be done um, uh, by entry level positions. Um, so I, I think of it as, as a really, really important uh, part of our industry uh, that we need to emphasize and keep growing. And by the way, this photo here was one of our one of our deconstruction trainings. So this was a group of a group of young folks learning how to deconstruct homes out of Portland. And then there's the additional jobs, and this is hard to measure. Um, the, what I was talking about with the last slide were the deconstruction um, and the primary reuse jobs, but then there's the secondary. Um, think about the, the reuse retailers um, and then who we sell to, the offshoots from, offshoots from that, the upcyclers, the, the other folks downstream from that, which we don't even know how to measure right now. Um, we can't get a grasp on how many jobs are actually being created through our industry. Again, all from materials that were they crunched and thrown into a landfill um, would create far fewer jobs and waste that material. So what's up in our industry next? Um, you know, and who are we talking with? Uh, this is we, we meaning BMRA, uh, who are we talking with now? Um, we're talking with cities all over the country. Um, it's just starting to um, get very exciting. Um, I was part of the uh, deconstruction advisory group in Portland, Oregon, uh, where we came up with the legislation. It was the country's first legislation uh, re requiring deconstruction for homes of a certain age. Um, and we started getting calls from all over the country, and now BMRA and Portland are both getting calls from all over the country, from other jurisdictions, wanting to look at what we did there and wanting to um, try to emulate it in some way or another. Um, and, and I can add to this list of cities, this was just all that felt, all that fit nicely onto the slide. So people are really starting to pay attention to this as an option. Oops. All right, and this is a slide about what we're, why, why we're seeing this, um, what's up in our industry, but why people are turning, turning to deconstruction and, and reuse and what they're coming to us for. In Portland, of course, in San Francisco, we're looking at infill and gentrification um, and the issues that come around with that. Um, in Portland specifically, there were a lot of, there was a lot of community concern about the homes that were just coming down. Um, that, you know, community didn't want to see destroyed, didn't want to see come down. So deconstruction and reuse was, uh, was implemented not so much because of blight there, but because they wanted to slow down the demolition um, or stop it is what, well, there was one group in the, in the city called Stop the Demolition. Um, but it was an effort to slow it down a little bit um, put the reins on and say, hey, hey, wait a minute, if you're going to take these homes down, at least salvage this material. You know, there were gorgeous, gorgeous old, you know, uh, craftsmen coming down uh, without any thought to saving the materials. Uh, so this kind of, this is one very large reason why um, we're getting into this, um, or why some cities are talking to us. Uh, another, of course, is the urban blight that I mentioned before in abandoned neighborhoods. Uh, we're getting calls from, from communities around the country who are saying, you know, we have rows and rows and neighborhoods of houses that are decaying. Um, and I've taken a tour of some of them, seen them, and, and it's amazing. And, and many of them are just beyond repair. Uh, they just need to come down. Uh, and some folks are doing some good work with that, but there's so much more that we need to do. Um, and the other, of course, is the barns and old factories, um, which is a little more traditional. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, too, was new construction, new construction continuing with outdated practices. Um, and when I say that, I, I, I mean, without any mind to um, 
reclaiming materials um, without any ordinances involved. That if you're if you're taking materials out of a renovation, for example, and I come from 20 years as a remodeler, uh, so I know the pluses and minuses of this. But if you're if you're pulling materials out, should you get some kind of uh, of reward or, or thanks even or, or credits or something like that for reusing some of the material you pull out uh, back into the project. Um, and I know some of that's being done, but it's being done uh, primarily because people see the value in it. Um, is there any way to encourage that in, in new, new construction or remodeling is a, is a big question for me. Um, what's exciting for me, again, is seeing um, all the cities um, talking to us um, and, and seeing it, it happen in the commercial market. Um, seeing commer as a lot of our work in the past has tended to be more residential oriented um, because the big dogs couldn't wrap their head around it. Um, one of the hardest problems in reuse is getting it involved in a design stage. And this is why I started with the slide I did. Um, it's very difficult for designers, architects, contractors, even if they want to incorporate reuse, it's very difficult to do it late in the game, late in the project. Um, it really has to go back to, um, and, and especially hard, I'm sorry, especially hard for commercial outfits to do it. I mean, these are folks that are planning job, jobs years in advance. Um, you know, how do you incorporate reclaim into that is a really, really big question, a really big challenge. Um, and what all of this is coming down to, in my mind, is, is, is coming down to and back to that sense of building integrated industry. Um, we may not have the uh, subsidies, if you will, and, and may never, but it's a nice dream if we could. Um, but if we can interconnect, if we can build the systems between ourselves, between our industries, that allows for, uh, I said one of my dreams is that when you call the lumber yard, local lumber yard, um, to order a lift of two by fours, the salesperson says to you, oh, do you, would you like new or reclaimed? And you have a choice. It's not impossible to dream about, um, but how we get there is only when all of these various um, people get involved get involved in it. Um, it has to it has to start with design. It has to and but it has to it can only start with design once the infrastructure is in place and the infrastructure will only be in place when we start playing with each other. Another example I like to use is denailing yards. Um, you saw the house being deconstructed on an earlier slide. Typically that lumber all comes down, all the nails have to come out. That's the most tedious part of the job, other than taking out plaster walls and, and lath, um, but taking all those nails out. And most deconstructors do it on their own, either on site or in a separate yard, and then they have to bundle up the material and then they have to try to sell it. Um, we need to learn from other industries and say, well, what if all of those, that two by material goes to a central place where there's a crew there uh, probably workforce development crew, um, denailing for anybody who brings it there and then piling up and packaging that material up and then it can be sold from that yard. So we're talking about systems and scaling things in such a way that we can build an industry that then a designer can look at it and say, yeah, I want to spec this material. I want to, I want to do the right thing here. Right now that industry is, is so small that it's very hard to get designers and contractors and builders to think of reuse at the beginning. And what's really exciting is that is starting to change and people are asking the big questions. Um, another, uh, this is just quick about um, some of the policy examples um, and what we think we can do getting, getting language and ordinance changes in that re requires reuse and deconstruction. That's been exciting work. Restricts demolition, that's the flip side of that, uh, or landfilling of materials. You guys in Grand Rapids, I can't wait to see, to get there and see what you, you all are doing um, with, your, with, your, uh, your proposed, or with your goals for C&D, it's awesome. Um, and then doing like Portland and Milwaukee have done and, and really trying to uh, demand that communities uh, look at these options a little more closely. So on the horizon for us, 
um, is researching the potential for uh, lumber in the mainstream market, as I was mentioning before, uh, working with government agencies, um, increasing the, the awareness between reuse and recycling. And I mentioned that again because I was at an EPA forum on, the, uh, on sustainable materials management, and they kept interchanging the words. Even the people that were running the forum kept saying recycle. And I had to stand up many times and say, no, we're talking about reuse, remember? Um, so it, we really have to keep clarifying that language. And then getting reuse, keeping reuse in those networks and in those language um, around uh, embodied carbon, uh, net zero building, all of those, we need to keep this um, language uh, alive in there. Our biggest challenges are lack of serious investment, which goes back to subsidies and, and that whole conversation. Uh, we still tend to be a bit of a scattered group that are not organized, um, but that's what the BMRA is for. Uh, we are trying to be the leaders in that, w in that way and do more than just word of mouth uh, advertising. So in summary, um, I couldn't help but use Woodsy Owl here. Um, when I was a kid, I remember Woodsy. Um, and he was, I mean, everybody laughed at Woodsy. It was like nobody, nobody took that, took it seriously. It was, but it was the start of something. Um, and right now, I see so many amazing people working on so many amazing projects and ways of doing things and ways of thinking that it gives me heart. You know, I think, you know, give a hoot, don't pollute was within my lifetime. It was, you know, um, 50 years ago or so, and I remember it and I. See see how long we've come, come from there. And then I see the kids now who are changing the world, um, who are at an age when, you know, all I wanted to do was party, um, but they're doing amazing things. And I think our job is to give this next generation the best tools we can to work with. Uh, we have the experience, we have some knowledge, and um, we're in control of things right now but we need to change things in ways that's gonna allow them to move forward and, and really make the big changes for us. So thank you all. Hey, yeah, before we wrap up, we're gonna real quick uh, jump in with, uh, with some of the, uh, the lead items that we wanted to discuss and I actually, um, Wanted to go over something um, that Joe brought up in regards to the, uh, or I guess the term we've we've loosely held around here is uh, is dirty murs. Um, I don't know how accurate of a term that is, but uh, um, but it is one that I've uh, just recently learned within the last uh, within the last few months. Um, so in regards to lead, it does seem like they actually um, want to start to address that. Um, there is a uh, extra credit uh, within the rating system here uh, that you can see on their website uh, where if you can uh, find a third party approved um, uh, recycling facility where it's basically, there's a lot of details here so you can go on their website and check it all out, um, but if you can verify uh, that it's actually being recycled um, in, or, or reused in some way, um, then there's an extra point for that. So it's not required right now, so they still are, you know, to Joe's point, rewarding for things that might be going to a place that um, otherwise, you know, second to that isn't getting um, um, recycled. Um, and so they actually, it looks like they're pulling from the uh, Recycling Certifications Institute Certification of Real Rates COR protocol. So um, you can check a little bit more about that. Um, but as far as the specific credits we were going to go over, um, so for lead, so there's kind of uh, there's kind of two ways to um, get to this. Um, you know, one of them is on the intake and on the outtake, and so you've got um, product reuse and waste diversion via reconstruction. So um, materials and resource environmentally preferable products, and then some exemplary performance within lead. Um, and so here on the environmentally preferable products, um, which is in the materials and, and resource section, um, you can see that um, in option two, they're looking at um, components that have at least been 25% reclaimed, salvaged, refurbished, or reused 
uh, materials from various projects. And so typically most, there's a lot of different items listed there, but I think the ones you're mostly going to find, um, you know, you're not probably going to be reusing old insulation, uh, maybe to some degree, but ones you're probably going to find is if you can pick three of these and find it um, in the local reuse market, Habitat Restore, you name it, um, you can pick up uh, an extra point for that. So there is some, um, some incentive there um, for any of these doors, cabinets, counters, interior trims, decking patio, or, or windows. Um, and then moving on to the output side, um, if you're doing a gut rehab project, there is what we call um, exemplary, exemplary performance, um, which is in the innovation and design section, additional strategies. And so uh, this is outside. So if you're doing a project, you'll see there's points for waste diversion. Uh, this is outside of that. They don't care about the existing piece. They're talking only about the new construction. So this is an additional, if you can um, divert 50% of the existing building components from the landfill, um, then uh, you can score an extra point um, in that regard. So that's it about LEED. Okay, back to me, I think. Um, and just wanted to let you all know too that we hold, BMRE holds an annual conference. Um, it's in a different part of the country every year um, and is usually towards the end of September. Um, this year uh, we happen to be in Grand Rapids, which is so exciting. I can't wait to, can't wait to see Grand Rapids and what you're up to there. Um, our, 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 our theme this year is Reclaim, Redesign, Reimagine. Um, because we're wanting to look a little more holistically at our entire industry and all the various players there. Um, we'd like to see architects come and, um, and look into that challenge about design. Um, we'd like to see um, contractors come. We'd like to see waste haulers come. We'd like to see a broader part of our industry coming together um, to reimagine together what our industry looks like and how we can shape our future. So um, I hope that many, if not all of you, can come and um, take advantage of the coupon, please. Um, and then one last note, I want to let you know what BMRE is up to in general. We have the conference, of course. Um, if any of you are used to our website um, and have gotten frustrated with it, please go back and look again. Uh, we just refreshed our website last week, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, it's a refresh, not a total rebuild, but um, it should go a long way in answering more of your questions about our industry and what the BMRA is up to. We've expanded our trainings. Uh, we've made them much clearer and easier to understand. Um, we've opened a, a business consulting um, tr um, uh, process as well. Uh, and then really what we're refocusing on is expanding our network um, within our industry. We're visioning ourselves um, more and more as the conduit, um, the place where people come to learn from each other and pass information through. Um, we're a very small organization. We know we can't do everything, um, can't even try to. Um, but what we can do is hook people up together uh, that are doing great work and make sure that um, our industry and the building material uh, recovery stays in the minds of all of the folks in our broader industry that are trying to do good work. So um, our, our motto now is working to create a vibrant building material reuse economy as part of a world without waste. So I invite you all to join us in that work. And thanks for what you do too. All right. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so we've got some time for questions here. I see some questions rolling in. Uh, real quick before we get to those questions, uh, I just wanted to thank um, all of our uh, members, our board of directors, our volunteers. Uh, thank you for all attending and making this happen. Thanks to our sponsors, uh, Build Equinox, CERV, Smart Ventilation, Geo Comfort, um, Niagara Conservation, Lowest Blowing Toilet on the Planet, Panasonic Ventilation, uh, sure Energy, um, Microgrid, On The Go, and um, In Your House Solutions, and T-Stud. Um, make sure to check out uh, the um, survey at the end. Uh, and for those of you listening live, you can take that survey, win a chance to um, 
for free, a ticket, free ticket to the um, event uh, that Joe just mentioned. And for those of you watching in the future, make sure to take your 10 question quiz with an 80% passing rate to get your CEUs. So um, one of the questions that came in, Joe, uh, was uh, if C&D is banned from the landfill, where, where would it go? Um, hopefully it goes lots of different places. Um, and I, I don't know that it's practical to say that it can all be banned um, because some of it, I mean, quite frankly, you know, we've invented a lot of materials that don't have uh, a next life. And, um, you know, particle board comes to mind, um, you know, particle board cabinets from a very large box store, which I won't name, um, are, are made for one use. Um, there's a lot of planned obsolescence, obsolescence in our world, and we can't make up for that. So there, there's a, a the more complex answer to this is how do we start designing so that things can be reused? Um, we've spent the last 70 years building things that, that a, a large portion of them are very hard to reuse. So I, I don't personally believe we can get away from landfills very quickly just by diverting materials. We have to look at the far, at the other end of the spectrum as well. That's the long answer. Um, but a lot of the materials that do go to transfer stations and MERS now can be diverted. And if we focus our attention on that first, um, that's going to reduce the size of the problem significantly um, and ease the pressure on our landfills um, so that then we can deal with what's left a little more effectively and channel our industry uh, energies in other ways. Um, and so this is a a pretty broad question. I mean, I think this question pretty much um, entails the entire presentation. But maybe you can, um, and and I think it's also very hyper localized. But maybe you can quick broadly speak to it. You know what? Uh, so the question is, what building materials are often uh, reuse, reclaim from existing buildings. What materials do not have a good system for reuse in place at this time? Yeah, it does vary locally, um, but there, there's common themes there. Um, what varies more dramatically, however, is commercial or residential. Um, but the, the materials that are most often reused and reclaimed um, are um, windows, doors, um, any anything, what I failed to talk about when I was talking about deconstruction is what's called soft strip, uh, where uh, a decon, decon crew can go in and take down, take out anything that is non-structural. And typically most of those uh, are reusable if it's decent enough quality. Um, so that's the other variable is quality. Um, if you get into uh, a lot of bad materials that were put into homes for a while, those are, are much harder to reclaim. Uh, lumber is the other one. Um, again, lumber on shorter dimensions uh, can be very hard to, to reclaim and use uh, to any good, any good fashion. Um, but uh, uh, flooring can definitely, definitely be redone, except for the laminated flooring. Again, that, that might be, uh, I know, in a way, a short-term good use of materials to, to to make a very thin floor as opposed to a, a three-quarter inch uh, piece of wood, um, but it's a very short-term uh, short term gain. Uh, so on the commercial side, oh wow, um, it, it's more challenging um, because it's, it, it has to go to the end user. Residential stuff can be used in residential more easily in a lot of ways than commercial stuff can. Uh, think of you know, uh, a 10 story office building being stripped down, um, 10 stories worth of windows, commercial windows, who's going to want to reuse those windows? It's a, it's a big part of the equation. Um, another ceiling tile. Ceiling tiles are actually much more, much more reusable um, if they're intact. Uh, carpet tiles are another one that can be reused. Uh, I can sell them all day in my old stores, uh, not a problem. Um, let's see what else. Um, steel, not so much. Uh, there's, there's 
a lot of questions and issues around reusing steel without it being tested again. Uh, those kinds of questions are big. Timbers sometimes have similar questions, but timbers, timbers can be remanufactured for, for more decorative uses. If they are going to be reused structurally as timbers, they do need to be regraded again, so that's kind of a barrier sometimes. But the value of them aesthetically often overweighs that for folks. Um, it's easier almost to say what can't be uh, easily reused or reclaimed. Um, particle boards, uh, anything with uh, uh, cheap laminates, um, things with um, asbestos, of course, or, or lead, um, and then um, I'm fishing for the other one, sorry. Missed it. Um, but but hazardous, hazardous waste, of course, but uh, anything that's just flimsy, you know, and we built so much of it. You know, the house I live in now, it's it's uh, built in 1887. And if this house came apart, um, I would say 90% of it has value. Sorry, I hope that got to the question well enough. Yeah, that was great, Joe. Well, hey, I uh, really appreciate um, your time and the uh, Building Materials Reuse Association for having you out. Really looking forward to the conference that's coming up. Uh, looks like we're over time here, and that's all the questions we got. So real quick before we can wrap up, uh, where do people go to get more information um, if they want to learn more? Real simple website, bmra.org. All right. Well, hey, uh, take care, everybody. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, folks.